to the Recovery Crew Podcast. I'm Dr. Bob Bear, and uh, <clears throat> this is produced by Deep Waters Recovery Network and Programs. Uh, today we have the uh, we have uh, a guest, Trevor Cocheris, who's going to uh, we're going to chat about the seventh step uh, in the twelve steps, which is uh, that's the step where we uh, sort of uh, make a decision to let go of the things that aren't working in our life and uh, uh, there's some actions related to that that I, th I think it'll be a fun discussion. Uh, glad you're with us today. Uh, here on at Deep Waters, we're focused on helping people transcend uh, dependency, uh, to transform uh, trauma, and to launch into lives of meaning. So I'm glad you're joining this uh, discussion with us in the community. We have programs for just about anyone who's ready to start that process and also we, we're a referral network so we can pretty much uh, send folks in the right direction. Uh, so uh, to, to reach out to us uh, it's at admin at deepwatersrecovery.com or you can go to the website deepwatersrecovery.com. This podcast is on all of the podcast platforms and um, you can find us on the YouTube channel if you want to watch the uh, video version of this. <clears throat> And uh, please like, share, and uh, uh, you know, forward this to anybody who might get something out of it. We're trying to build this community, and we really appreciate uh, you connecting with us. So let's get this thing started today. We're really glad you're here. It says it says that it's recording. So there you have it. And uh, so I don't know. Is there anything else to fool around with? That hat. Um, I don't know. I could make fun of that hat. Is it Pittsburgh or is it? What the hell is that? It's actually Puma. So it's it's a golf brand. Oh, it's a golf brand. All right. So I think you kicked my ass last time we played, so I don't <laughs> want to talk about that. Um, we have new clubs, so though. I have new clubs that uh -oh. hasn't changed anything. <laughs> actually, it, it has. Uh, I don't know. You're more, way more of a golfer than I am, but I feel like I have intention with each club now. It's like this was this is on purpose. I have this guy. I didn't just kind of stumble into them. Do you know what I mean? Or I mean, or I have an emotional I have an emotional connection with my clubs. Well, that's that we need to get you a therapist then if that's the case. <laughs> <laughs> really? I, you're serious. It's like this I'm, is I'm like, dead serious. No, yeah. I mean, I I can tell you a story that um before I got sober, I had a set of irons that I sold to the dope man. And when I got sober this time and I moved to Austin, I uh, went out and bought those exact same irons ah. because I had such an emotional connection. To it. Nice. Hey, this is going to be fun. I like that, yeah. that, that yeah. kind of shit right there. We'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll keep that all that in here. All right. So uh, let's do this thing. So, oh, well, look who we have here. Look who we have here. Uh, Trevor Kucheris. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, here he is, baseball cap and all. He, I, I just found out it's, it's Puma. It's not Pittsburgh or Philadelphia or uh, Puny or anything. It is Puma because uh, he's kind of a sports guy. He's already beat the hell out of me out on the on the golf course, so we won't talk much about that. Uh, we'll 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 uh, avoid that topic. Uh, we're really glad you're here now, uh, Trevor. Well, let's talk about. So here we are at Deep Waters Recovery Program and Network. And uh, this is the recovery crew. Um, so I want to say a little, if you want to reach out and be part of this thing, uh, our uh, program manager is uh, Nicole Chargois. That's a fun name. Try saying that, uh, Trevor. It's fun to say Chargois. 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 Yeah. Anyway, Nicole, <laughs> I shouldn't make fun of people's names. I'm not really. I like it. And I like Nicole. She is our uh, program manager. Why don't you uh, pipe in here? Uh, before we get started and let folks know how they can uh, how they can reach us. Are you still there, Nicole? Yeah, yeah, you guys did a good job with my name. Thank you. Uh, welcome to the Recovery Crew podcast. We would love to hear from you. You can reach us at 512-677-7847. That's 512-677-7847. Uh, if you have any questions about our program, comments, or if you want to be part of our podcast, please reach out. You can also email us at admin at deepwatersrecovery.com. That's A-D-M-I-N at deepwatersrecovery.com. Nice. Thank you. Uh, 
So here we have Trevor Cocheris. Uh, he and I had a real a juicy conversation <laughs> on the golf course about uh, about the drop the rock step six and seven thing. Enough to know that this is this is an area of recovery that's been pa a passionate uh, uh, pursuit and area of study for both of us. So I'm glad you're here today. This is going to be fun. Uh, Trevor is the client care coordinator at the Last Resort Treatment Center out in Smithville, Texas, and uh, he's actually way more than that. I call out there, and he seems to be in every office. I don't know how you can be in all all those uh, different offices at once, but that's the downside of being good at a lot of stuff. People ask you to do a lot of stuff. That's why I, well, I don't like letting – my, my dad uh, said, make sure when you're painting a house you get paint on the windows uh, so that no one will ask you to do it again. It's a <laughs> – you have to be careful uh, being competent. All right. So, but I know you love all that stuff and they're, they are doing good work out there. So, uh, uh, so yeah, I think, uh, so uh, uh, I think you're finishing your degree. This is my, this is by way of introducing you finishing yeah, yeah. Your degree, uh, cl sneaking up on the LCDC, which is the Texas license for chemical dependency counselors. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, uh, I've got about a year left in my undergrad, and uh, I've got, really, I'm getting ready to start my practicum hours for my LCDC. And so, um, Doc, it's been a great journey. It's been, a, it's been a, uh, an interesting journey and uh, a fun one. So, yeah. um, I heard you challenges. Get, did, I, did, did, I, did I read it right? I know this. I know the answer to it. You're engaged <laughs> to be married? Is that correct? I am. I am. I, 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 that's advanced yeah. stuff right there. You know, I, it's, it's funny how that worked out is I moved to Austin and then within a month I found the woman that I was going to marry and spend the rest, rest of my life with. And so we've been together about two years. We're getting married in, in September. Uh, she's been, she's in recovery. She's been sober about seven years herself. Mm. Uh, she's a, a very kind soul and a wonderful soul. And I'm very, very lucky. And I'm still not sure what she's doing with me, but it's a bonus. Are. It's a bonus when I, you know, cause we're about to get your story. It's a bonus when some of us who have done some of the shit we've done is somebody, of course, you know, there's another part of it too. And I know you, you are uh, deep and it's true for a lot of us in recovery. Uh, uh, the, there is a deep beauty in, in our souls. And we were trying to, I don't know what we were trying to do, but uh, with all that stuff, but we we're trying to enhance that feeling of beauty mm -hmm. and then it got out of control. But anyway, I'm glad for you, brother. And I'm glad you. that you're with Thank us you. today. Uh, we're going to talk about several things, mostly on the seventh step. But first, I want to get the story, the kind of uh, how, uh, you know, what happened and uh, what changed in your life to get you here. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And again, Doc, thanks for having me. Um, I, I, I'm very blessed and fortunate where my life is at today. And uh, so let's just get into it. I mean, I grew up in uh, Enid, Oklahoma. It's about uh, about an hour and a half northwest Oklahoma City. And I have two very loving parents that are still married. I have a younger sister um, who's 18 months younger than me. And so um, we were always pretty close just because we were so close in age. Her friends were my friends. My friends were her friends type of deal. Um, I had a very normal childhood, a uh, very loving home. My mom is a retired Presbyterian minister. My dad's an oil and gas landman. And so um, I didn't really have to want for anything. Everything was provided for my sister and I. Um, you know, I was always kind of the runt. I'm not a very big guy. Um, even to this day, I'm only probably 160 pounds soaking wet, um, and I'm only like 5'11". So my dad is, you know, about, about the same. And so I was kind of a late bloomer. I, um, all my friends were getting taller and I stayed short. Um, and so when I was 16, I was like 120 pounds and like 5'7". So I was just a always a little guy. And because of that, I felt a lot of inadequacy in my life. Mm. I felt like I wasn't worth a whole lot of um, things. I, I was never fast enough. I was never big enough. I couldn't play. I loved sports, but I could never play, you know, the, the sports that everybody else was playing just because I wasn't big enough. Um, but one thing I did play was a lot of golf. And my dad taught me how to play golf at a very early age. I think I picked up a club when I was five years old, and it just be, kind of became my thing. It was something that I could do independently. I didn't have to be on a team, and um, I enjoyed it, and I excelled at it. But, you know, growing up, um, I kind of grew up in, I would say, like a country club atmosphere. Um, you know, and I never felt good enough. And so I started, you know, dabbling with drugs and alcohol when I was around, you know, 14, 15 years old. Um, 
really just to fit in. I didn't really do it to kind of really change the way I felt. I don't, I don't think at the time, but I did it more, mainly just to kind of fit in. Sure. Um, my buddies were doing it and it was like, oh, okay, well, you know, I can do this and feel accepted. And, and that's what I did. Um, so kind of a quick condensed rundown version of, of my story is that, you know, nothing really bad happened in my life. I, I didn't, I didn't have any kind of physical or, or emotional or, or sexual trauma in my life. It was really just, I just didn't like the way that I felt. I just felt inadequate. Um, so then I found, like I said, I found drugs and alcohol, mainly marijuana and, and whiskey, um, and beer. And, uh, but when I was 19 years old, I, um, I went off to college. I graduated high school, went off to college in Oklahoma city at the university of central Oklahoma and, um, bounced around college, for a while but when I was 19 I got my wisdom teeth cut out and they prescribed me Percocet bum, and it was, bum, bum. should we put some yeah bum bum bum. bum 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 and there's actually something, a song isn't there some rap song with Percocet in it I'm sure there is Great. if there's not there should be um, <laughs> it's like I could play my daughter plays she's 18 say, are you kidding <laughs> anyway, go ahead. Go ahead. no um so yeah, they, they prescribed me Percocet and I remember feeling this warm, fuzzy feeling and it was like, man, like all the, the, the bullying and the inadequacy and everything that I went through in, in, in early adolescence and even late adolescence for that matter, it like just went away. Um, yeah. And I loved it and it was prescribed to me and I didn't have to hide it. And it was like, oh, I just will take another one, I'm in pain and nobody asked any questions. Mm, it's like um, I found God, and right, it was prescribed right. by the gods, right? God, right. The doctors are the God. So right. how could it be wrong? And so I was a um, I was a product of the early two thousands oxycontin epidemic, mm. and you know, in 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 oh five oh six and and all that kind of stuff. And so uh, it was very easy to get. I remember I ran out. I got a dry socket. The doctor prescribed me, you know, another another script of it. So I was like, oh, okay, this is easy. And that, what I didn't know at the time, Bob, was that it was going to like catapult me into the next, what I call a decade under the influence. Mm. Um, I had no idea what this was going to do. And so I got to, I went back to school, flamed out real quick, um, started, you know, using Oxy um, every day, all day. Um, and then one day after my 21st birthday, I came back um, and my dealer didn't have any oxy but he had heroin and at this point i was dabbling with needles and i just said you know what i'm i'm dope sick i'm not going to be so sick anymore so let's give it a shot and in that moment at 21 22 years old shooting heroin i i didn't think anything could be any better uh, I can't, I tell guys this all the time that, you know, when I try to describe what heroin was like the first time I, it was like that God came down and wrapped me up in a warm blanket and held me in his arms. Yeah. That's exactly what I thought. Um, and then the rest is just like a, a nightmare that I wouldn't want anybody else to endure. Yeah. I, um, remember the first time my dad kind of found out, um, that I was using heavy drugs he said, Trevor, what's going on? I said, you know, I'm, I'm addicted to painkillers. I wasn't going to say that I was addicted to heroin. I'm addicted to painkillers. And he said, what do you need from me? And I remember I told him, I said, I need to go to life rehab. Because at this point, I had endured a bunch of robberies. Um, I hadn't overdosed yet, but I endured a bunch of robberies. And my life was just in shambles. I wasn't hanging out with good people. Like I said, I flamed out of school. Um, it was just going nowhere fast. Um, so I went to treatment. Got out of treatment. Everything was good. I don't need to go to sober living. You need to go to sober living. I, you know, it's um, kind of that's, cool. that's like, that's got a ring in your ears. Over oh, you know, uh, it's, for, for it's. For are listening, Trevor is the guy that says that every day to these guys. Hey, every day. The chances of uh, staying sober are much uh, increased if you go to six months of sober living, right? Which is why I'm the perfect guy for the job. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so um, nothing changed nothing changed. I wasn't ready to get sober. I just needed a break. You know, I wanted to dry out. I wanted to, to just take a break. And so for the next, you know, gosh, eight years, I went to treatment, you know, seven more times. Um, there's some overdoses in there. I spent um, a couple, you know, I spent at least a full year, like basically almost living out of my car. There was some breaks in between where my parents would let me come back home. But, um, you know, I spent the majority, you know, kind of living in and out of a car and, and sleeping on couches or sleeping in hotel rooms and um, suicide attempts. And it just, 
nothing was nothing was working. Um, I remember in 2012, I was living in a Motel 6. I just won fantasy football, so of course I spent all that money on on heroin. And I remember it was a white Christmas. The first time in Oklahoma City we had a white Christmas in a lot of years. I remember calling my sister and wishing her Merry Christmas. And she said, Merry Christmas to you. And she goes, I said, I, I, I wish I was there with you guys. And she goes, so do I, but I'm really glad you're not. Mm. And I remember thinking in that moment, like, I didn't know what to do. Mm. And I had fully committed to go ahead and, and just kill myself. You know, I didn't know what else to do. Yeah. Um, nobody, I didn't feel anybody loved me. That feeling of inadequacy that I tried to escape from, yeah. which is why I started doing drugs, was back in full force. Like, I didn't feel good enough to be a part of my own family. And they didn't want me. Yeah. What I learned later on in life was, wasn't that they didn't want me. They didn't want the person I was becoming. Yeah. And there's two different, two different things there. And so I, I did. I tried to kill myself. And I, I tried to, you know, accidentally overdose when it was intentional. And, and I woke up. Um, <laughs> and it just, nothing just got better. I was in a dark place. Um, I just was, and so I went to treatment a few more times, and then I started getting in legal trouble when I was 26, 27, and I caught a bunch of felonies all at once. Um, ultimately, in 2017, on April 15th, 2017, um, my saving grace came in the form of silver bra bracelets in a shithole county in Oklahoma that I had no idea where I was um, for possession of heroin. Police officer took me in. I kicked, I withdrew off heroin, Xanax, and alcohol in this county jail. Um, which, is kind of was, which is kind of dangerous, right? Very dangerous. You know, um, they, uh, I didn't know if I was going to make it. I didn't eat for almost 13 days because the hallucinations and the detox off the Xanax and alcohol was so bad. Um, it was rough. My, my mom could tell you now, like, she didn't think I was going to make it. Yeah. And there was a lot of moments where my parents, you know, didn't think I was going to make it, yeah. but they didn't know what else to do. And so at this point in my life, we had done the treatment. We, I got sent to the best, you know, treatment centers. I got sent to the best aftercare situations. And I took everything for granted, yeah. everything. For granted. And so essentially what happened was my parents said, you know, we're not bailing you out. We're not getting you an attorney. Um, you're going to have to figure this out. And I had gotten in so much trouble at this point that, you know, they the state of Oklahoma wouldn't send me away to, for seven to 10 years. Hmm. But the funny thing about it, um, Bob, was that even though I had nothing, I was at, I was in, I was at peace. When I got through that, that detox, I was scared to death, but I didn't have to run anymore. Yeah. I had three meals a day. I had a place to sleep. Yeah. It, well, did it suck? Absolutely. But like, I didn't have to struggle. You didn't have to struggle. And it's, I think it's, we, we're not going to spend the whole podcast on this, but we could. The, it takes a lot for the family to get this thing, right? This loving family of yours. Why do they keep enabling that? Because they love you and they didn't have the education. It took the same amount of pain for them to retract the fixing. And then I'll bet in that moment you realized, wow, this is my only chance if they stop fixing this stuff. And I'm right. addicted to them fixing it. Right. 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 <laughs> so, uh, wow. That's a, I just want to throw that out there. We need to do a whole program on, <laughs> on the family, uh, the family aspect of this, but we okay. could, Sorry. we very easily could. Right. And, and so I spent three months in that County jail and, um, I got blessed. Um, you know, my dad, they were going to send me to prison. I mean, they just were, um, I didn't have anything. I was just basically waiting I hadn't signed for any time yet, but I was, it was going to happen. Um, and my dad, something happened. I'm not sure, but he went, went ahead and hired me an attorney. And that attorney came in and he said, okay, so here's the deal. Um, you're going to have to go away. Um, but where you're going to go is you're going to go to a one year long program called CARE and CARE stands for Christian Addicts and Alcoholics in Recovery. And you're going to go to work. That's what you're going to do. And if you do good for a year, all this will go away. And I was just ready to get out of jail. I was just ready to get out of jail. Yeah. So I said, okay, I'll go. And so I, I had to wait a couple more weeks before they had a bed open. And I get to this facility up and all the way up in Northeast Oklahoma. And it's a little town called Jay, Oklahoma. And it's right on the border of Arkansas and Missouri. And there's maybe 1,200 people in that town, maybe. 
and 220 of them were at the facility that I was at. So I was there with 220 other guys, all there for the same reason, to not go to prison, or they had just gotten out of prison, or they had been to prison, or they were on community sentencing or drug court, whatever. That's where the state sends you. And my job um, there was to go work at a feed ingredient store, a processing plant called Simmons Feed Ingredients, and they're a poultry plant. Cleaning chicken. I, clean, literally. Literally. <laughs> the country boy club. They're the country club boy cleaning shit. It's just, uh, the image is just important. It's, um, so my job, if you picture this, is I stood in an assembly line. And what they do is they defeather the birds. The birds go around this assembly line. Um, there's a section that takes the guts and they draw the guts out to the side. Uh, and then they comes over to me and I take the guts and I drop them off and I pull them off. Um, and they drop into this trough. It's where they make other stuff with. And I did that um, for eight hours a night. Uh, you got two breaks. You got a, you got two 15-minute breaks and a 30-minute break. And uh, that was my job. Uh, they call it the Pac-Man machine because I would just sit there and pull guts. 96 wow. birds a minute. Pulling guts. And uh, pulling guts. And so I didn't know what that was teaching me at the time. And it was teaching me what we're going to go into in step seven in, in humility. Mm. Um, my ego – and my arrogance was out of this world. Um, as you said, country club kid, didn't really have to want for anything, didn't have to really work hard for anything, had great jobs, had great family, had all the money, and here I am. This is where my life took me. Yeah. This is where my choices took me. And this is where my disease took me. And I kept telling myself, okay, like, I've, I got through one night, I got through another night, I got through another night, and I just kept saying, I'll quit tomorrow, I'll quit tomorrow, I'll quit tomorrow. Then I was able to put some, some days and some months together. My saving grace there came, another, another dog wink that I have is that I had this ex-bandito biker that would come out there and um, work the steps with me. Mm. And I just decided, you know what, what else do I have to lose? Yeah, you the know? Kind of, probably the kind of guy that you would never uh, – Right, we we right. pulls together people who would never mix otherwise. Right, right, right. And I fell in love with what that man was teaching me. Mm. And I fell in love with the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. I had worked the steps before, but I never really worked the steps before. Yeah. And I finally got to a place of willingness and surrender where I was just like, "What do I have to lose? I don't have anything to lose. I've lost everything." Yeah. And so why not? I'm getting chills thinking about it. It's like why, why not try something different? What's the worst going to happen? Worst is going to happen, I either die and I haven't been able to do that right or I go to prison. Yeah. Okay. Let's give it a shot. And my life changed. Yeah. I started noticing different behaviors that I've never seen before. I started enjoying life. I started seeing the world through a new pair of glasses. Um, it was euphoric. Just, it was, it was, it was wonderful. And, I ended up getting the opportunity to work at that facility after I finished um, and kind of help them work in their 12 step program that they were kind of starting up. And um, I was so doing that. So, so it wasn't a solid year of pulling guts. No, it wasn't a solid year of pulling guts, but pretty close. <laughs> wow. That's, that's significant, man. That, that is amazing. Uh, and it takes for all of us, it takes what it takes, I guess. Right. It does. You know, it's very unconventional. It's, it's not, it's unorthodox. It's not, you know, your traditional way of getting sober, I think. Uh, um, and so for me, the reason I love what I do now, um, Bob, is that, you know, I took for granted all those years of, I, of the resources that I did have. Yeah. And I saw so many guys at care that were just, that would have died to have one opportunity like I had. They were going back home to a gang life. They were going back home to a broken home, you know, drug-ridden neighborhoods. Like, they weren't going to survive. Yeah. And they were beg, like, like how, how ungrateful am I? How selfish am I to just piss all over those opportunities? Yeah. And that's why I love what I get to do, what I get to do today, is that I get to help set guys up. I get to share that with them to say, hey, you have an opportunity here. Don't take it for granted. Yeah. And that's good. Oh, that gives me my purpose. You know, our families are loving, but there's enabling that goes on an enmeshment that it's not their fault. We're not blaming it on them, but we have to look at it. Right. And it's, mm -hmm. I have, that's my main thing. It's like, I, my family bailed me out of so much. I didn't have to 
learn the con- what co- I didn't learn consequences. Right, <laughs> uh, right, and right. So it takes what it takes for all of us to find our way there. And uh, uh, my understanding is that there, there was a, a heavy twelve-step program as well, uh, and that you got launched and you've been going to you've been um, immersed in the program since, and now yeah. uh, uh, finding ways to really help others. I think that's have I capsulized the end of the story? <laughs> You have. I mean, essentially, you know, I got a phone call to come down here and work at TLR. I came down and, uh, and visited the place. Um, uh, the executive director, director and I go way back, um, childhood for that matter. And, and we, uh, he called me up and he said, dude, you need to come down here and check out what we're doing. And I did. And, um, I fell in love with it. Yeah. I just absolutely fell in love with the work that we do. And, um, I took a giant leap of faith. Um, I quit my job. At, at care and I didn't know anybody down in Austin but I packed all my stuff and I moved down here at, at a year and a half sober um yeah about a year and a half sober and haven't looked back yep now here you are getting Man. married getting married we star out at uh TLR <laughs> our, our mutual friend Corbin Bigheart the executive director out there I know he is uh grateful to have you in his corner because that's a big operation and they're really doing the Right now, they're dropping like flies out there, man, and they're making a space for. Uh, there's a there's a pretty good diverse uh, group of folks at the last resort. It's not just the country club boys, right? I mean, no, not at all, not yeah. at all. We've got uh, age demographic is kind of all over the place right now, which is a good thing. Um, we're able to help a lot of guys. Uh, um, I'll just say this, and as COVID has has been good to us. We've been able to help a lot of people that want to get sober during this pandemic. Well, that's one way to say it. And it's, it's like, thank God, you know, here, here's another perspective on, on that. It's like folks who were, uh, try, would have been another 10 years of doing what you were doing, which is, uh, you know, getting closer to the bottom and closer to the bottom, 10 years of misery, maybe this, uh, opportunity. In fact, I know this to be true. Folks have been, uh, the, 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 the disease has progressed faster and got them to the bottom. Uh, a Great. lot of treatment centers are just packed full right now. So it's uh, fortunate that, uh, and I know the work that you're doing out there is going to help them launch into a life that's uh, of recovery, that's sustainable, not just a band-aid. All right, enough of that. So <laughs> I want to transition. <laughs> well, well, there's so many things we could talk about here. Uh, thanks for your story, brother. That, you know, and the way, you know, when we tell our story, it's just one slice. I mean, right. I know there's so many other slices and uh, I'm glad you made it. I'm telling you, it's like you're, you and I are both a miracle, but right now I'm, I'm seeing you as a miracle and I'm grateful. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right. So we're going to transition to step seven, right? So here we, uh, just for a recap is we're a mess, right? Whatever, whatever, <laughs> your, drug, whatever your drug is, whether it's sex, love, uh internet um gambling drugs alcohol uh food i don't want to talk about food let's not get into that all right um but whatever it is right so we've got to get to a place where okay my way has not worked that is called the first step right Mm -hmm. i look at the mess that it's caused and i see that i can't do anything about it then there's a some of us get an idea that maybe there's something that could help also known as the second step you can use the word God if you want, or you can use other language. And then the third step is say, all right, I'm going to try something different. I'm going to let go of my way, try something else. Fourth step is looking at our side of the street, how we have created this mess, right? And we can't do that by ourselves because we can't see it. We need a good sponsor that can help us through it. And then we share all of that writing that we do about our character, uh, assets and defects, or whatever language you want to use. A lot of people don't like that defects word. I don't care what you call it, but it's not working. <laughs> whatever, whatever the stuff is that I'm doing that's creating chaos and pain in my life and others, I don't care what language you put to it. I got to look at it and unpack it with help from somebody that's been down the road before. And then uh, we get to step six, which is, all right, do, let me think. This is the pause place, maybe. You can say more about it if you want. But step six to me is we pause for a moment to see to, to reflect on whether or not I'm willing to drop the rock. If I am willing to let go of these nasty, 
you know, my manipulation, my, my self-centeredness, my selfishness, my, um, you know, doing it my way, my control on and on and on. It sounds Model like, a good th- yeah, it sounds like a good thing to let go of them, but do I really, <laughs> am I really ready? Step six is like forcing us. And in the big book, as you know, it's a very short little section. It doesn't expand. You have to kind of go to the, some other places to get some, uh, to, but it's a really opportunity. It's a real opportunity to contemplate and feel. Mm-hmm. And uh, step seven is moving into a little bit more action. But um, would you say I've encap- encapsulated uh, up to six fairly you've, well? You've, you've done a great job. I couldn't have done it better myself. You know, six and seven are those steps that everybody just kind of skips over. You know. Um, it's one of those things where it's like, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll, God can have those. You know, he can have those things, but then there's no action that follows it. And so, you know, set, six, excuse me, step six is all about surrender. If I'm willing to ask God to help me with these defects of character, then if I'm willing to do that, then taking the action in step seven can be just that much more easy. Because yeah. if you're willing to surrender to a power greater than yourself to – handle those certain character defects or take them from you then you can start doing better and you can start walking through life as a new person and those character defects where you fall short they just start falling off you yeah and and you don't even know it but don't you agree and don't you think about it sometimes i do that though the idea is so esoteric that god is going to remove my character it's like some weird comment what do you mean what is you know, I don't, somebody right. listening that hasn't been immersed in this stuff like you and me, I, I really want to talk about this in terms of what is it really. Uh, so for, let's go. Let's go back. First of all, uh, uh, action is really mm-hmm. important in this section of the work, right? That we mm-hmm. use that word a lot because uh, otherwise we're going to be head nodders like mm-hmm. you and I. Are. We go to mm-hmm. meetings and people say shit, and we nod our head, say, "Oh, very good," but we don't change anything. Right. <laughs> so, right. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a comfortability thing. It's like, oh, if I just shake, if it's, it's, it's comfortable, if I just shake my head, I don't have to say anything. That's right. So, and we're doing it a little now and uh, <laughs> it's okay. It's not, it, we, we got to understand this shit before we can have a chance to, you know, I, I don't even know what you're talking about when you say, let God have this. But anyway, all right. So I want to talk about this acting as if concept. Yep. So that, mm-hmm. I'll actually read something from uh, the book. Called, the book is called Drop the Rock. Uh, you can get it on Amazon. It's a, uh, it's approved literature for 12 step stuff, but it's good for life. I think it's good life stuff. If you can let the, if those of you that aren't doing the 12 step thing, if if you can get the, if you can let go of the, uh, being blocked by the jargon, there's a little bit of jargon in there, but okay. Acting as if here's a quote, I was never able to think my way into recovery, right? I'm talking, I'm sitting here across from a very smart dude right here. (laughs) <laughs> you know, smart really doesn't get us too far. All right. I was never <laughs> able to think my way into recovery. My mind created a tremendous amount of trouble for me. I need to turn my mind down, not off, by the way. I still get to think, you know. <laughs> the, the sign on the wall says think, 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 but not, I, I think, let's take two of those things off. Maybe. Right, think. right. All right. Uh, I soon discovered the difference between doing and thinking. The key to acting as if is faith. Mm-hmm. That's, you know, I think you you have uh, that word is a little bit loaded for some of us, too. But so, can you say a little bit about how does this acting as if uh, work? Why are we doing that? You know, I don't like using this you know the term you know kind of fake it till you make it type of deal. Um, but for me personally and, and you know i've got all these these character defects and i fall short all the time and 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 they're they're my survival techniques and so what i think the book of drop rock is trying to say and, and what you just said is that if you're if you're acting as if you're humble or if you're acting as if you're trying to do the next right thing then it starts to become habit and you don't even have to think about it and so you think, 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 you don't even think about it. It's just one of those things that just you just do. But and so if I can it, act. But at first uh, it doesn't occur to me. It goes against my grain, right? Well, sure, sure, I sure. Make, it, almost make myself be a good person, right? Right. You have to put in the good effort. The thing about it is like, it's like if some guy comes to you that you don't like 
and says hello. And the first reaction that you have is that you want to punch him in the face. But instead of punching him in the face, you stick out your hand and you shake it. That's acting as if. Yeah. It's saying, okay, I'm going to shake your hand. Even though I don't like you, it's the right thing to do. And you start doing that, and after practice and practice and practice, it just becomes natural in that, in that you start acting in your own, as your own self. Yeah. You're not faking it until you make it. You're just would, doing it. Would you agree that when we talk about this section of the work as action, that, that is that like to me, there's two actions. Because that's what I've got caught on step six and seven, because in the book, it really doesn't say what to do. Right? There's right. two things that I know to do. One is notice what I'm about to do one of my character flaws, one of my uh, shortcomings, right? I'm going to try to control somebody or I'm going to be short or abrupt or impatient and, and choose to take a breath and say something kind, possibly. That's an action. That's not just thinking about being a good person. That's an action. That's one. The other one is getting on our knees, actually doing this prayer thing. I think you've probably spent more times, time in that world than I have. For me, uh, you know, my dad wanted to make sure I wasn't Protestant. My mom wanted to make sure I wasn't Catholic. And that was the religion in my house. Don't let him be that, the other one. <laughs> so Fucking for me, all the time. <laughs> a little bit of fighting on their yeah. part, not too much, but because neither one of them cared about the religion themselves. They just didn't want their family to think that I was one or the other. But the, for me, I didn't even notice that. I just didn't, I didn't get indoctrinated is my point. So I've had the mm -hmm. freedom to like, hey, maybe Trevor, maybe Trevor's God. I don't know. Maybe this lamp. I don't, I've had a lot of freedom. And uh, actually, for me, it's a feeling now that comes when I know the truth is being spoken. So this prayer thing is not like in a Christian way for me, at least. And, and, but it's a, it's, a, it's a letting go of me controlling it and saying, all right, I'm going to just let the universe kind of handle this. That's an action, too. Agreed. Agreed. Yes. Yeah, I, and, and so a quick, real quick story on that is, as I told you, my mom was, uh, I, I grew up, my mom was a Presbyterian minister. And so I grew up in church a whole lot. And I remember my mom pulled me in one day, and this is when I was, you know, in the midst of getting sober this time. And, and she said, you have my permission not to believe in God. Hmm. That's it. That's all I needed. I was, I knew, I believed that there was something greater than me out there looking after me because I'd seen the evidence. I'd seen the data. I'm sitting here today for a reason. So what am I praying to? Well, it doesn't have to be a Christian God. It doesn't have to be my mom's God. It doesn't have to be anybody else's God. It just has to be my God. Yeah. And sometimes it's a trick. Sometimes it's a trick, mm -hmm. Trevor, I think, this prayer mm -hmm. thing. Because, you know, when I'm, when I'm praying, you know what I can't be doing very easily is trying to think – think my solution mm -hmm. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. like it's, it, especially if i'm praying for somebody else right it's I get like, it. it's, no i i get it i totally get it it's like a trick it's a little bit like yoga and breathing i get so tired i'm focused on this movement <laughs> i can't be planning out a bunch of shit when i'm doing that it just gets my it shuts my my controlling mind off for a short period of time and to choose to do that stuff is is an action it's an mm -hmm. action here's 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 a concept i want to hear you say something about that there's a concept in there what are the principles of the of my program what are the principles right we, we have this 12 traditions and 12 steps and there's there's a thousand different uh ways to describe but somebody said there's not a thousand there's very it, it's a thousand it's a few simple things said in a thousand different ways. Right, right. <laughs> Very simple stuff. But, you know, what, and this helped me a lot. So what are the principles that I'm going for? Because I heard you say uh, doing the next right thing. I, how do I, I don't know what's right. How, who, who says that, by the way? Where, can, should, is there some religion somewhere that, I, no, here, here's what they say in the book. And I, these are old timers that have been doing this for a while. I agree with it. The principles are the opposite of my, shortcomings the opposite mm -hmm. of my uh whatever my personal things like uh whatever whatever that list is procrastination whatever the list that and it's all driven by fear of course uh but those things if i can do the opposite make myself try doing the opposite just for the entertainment value of it <laughs> right <laughs> then, then i'm then i'm like the, the that's what i'm kind of headed for do you know what i'm you know what I'm talking about? I do. It's that uncomfortable feeling of you think that you're going against the grain when you're actually not. 
right. and you've been going because and you figure out that hey, I've actually been going against the grain my entire life, and that's all that I know how to do. And now I've switched it up, and I'm actually why does why does doing the right thing feel so weird? And for me, I had to get that was not an easy thing for me to do. You know, my first initial reaction to anything was to lie, cheat, steal, manipulate, yeah. um, cop resentments. You know, that's how I survived. And when I realized that I, I didn't have to do that, that I could stop, I could take a breath, I could pause. And even if it was something that I thought was going to get me in trouble, I could show you a little humility and get honest. That was new. And that was life-changing for me, Bob. It, 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 it changed my entire life. I can't, I can't speak on it enough. It, it, it's, it's like, I don't have to be the person that I was used to being. I don't have to go against the grain all the time. I can be Trevor and be okay with that. Right. It's, it's, it, and there's a, you know, there's this part of us that thinks this whole idea about shortcomings and uh, you have character defects, you're something wrong with you, right? It's like, oh, please, let's just lose the semantics problem. <laughs> and and, and, and uh, one of the concepts we can think about is, uh, uh, stripping away. And we wonder if we're going to be the hole in the donut. We talked about that. In other words, if mm -hmm. you take all this stuff away, I'm going to be nothing. But really, it, what we're doing is taking away the stuff that's blocking who, who we really are. So there's this story in there about the covered up chair. This guy's got this incredibly expensive, nice chair that he threw all this shit on. He didn't even know he had an expensive chair until he finally cleaned some stuff up in this sparkling, beautiful antique uh, was there. So the quote in there is, uh, I covered myself up with all sorts of things. It's a program of getting rid of the things that are in the way of my beauty and value. I love that. Get the, getting rid of the things that are in the way of my beauty and value to the world. It's a program of uncovering, discovering, and discarding. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's not just be a good person. No, it's about unveiling uh, the, the beauty of being alive for me you know and it takes some a little bit of work yeah it does take work i mean it takes it, it because you're it's it's raw it's it's you're not used to it it's it's uncomfortable um there's a there could be a lot of shame and guilt that surrounds that it's like oh i don't want to open it up i don't want to uncover everything for everybody because what if they what if they don't like me or what if they think that uh, i'm weird or what or whatever the case might be it's like i'm not willing to give up everything because that protects me yeah but when you start peeling off a layer at a time, it doesn't have to be real fast. You can do it at your own pace, but as you start peeling off a layer at a time, you start to kind of, okay, this isn't so bad. Yeah, you're like, it wasn't try, so bad. Try it. You, try it, you might like yeah, it. <laughs> you might like it. And then next thing you know, you're completely uncovered and you're completely raw and it's real emotion. And guess what? You're still standing. You didn't die. Yeah. You're still sitting there. Yeah. And and then you've you've continued to change and you've continued to grow and that's the whole point of this, isn't it? Yep. And it's it's so uh, you mentioned it a few times. I've always so this humility. Uh, the reason we uh, humility is always the topic when we talk about the seventh step because what, what's the seventh step is we humbly ask God to remove our shortcomings. Did I get that right? You did. You did. Um, yeah. uh, uh, so here, my dad used to say, "What's the one thing that you lose once you know you have it?" <laughs> humility right so right, right. it's like I, I always get a kick out of, i'm getting a kick out of us we're gonna tell people what we know about humility which is not very humble uh, i always get a kick in meetings when people are explaining how humble they are and that they've uh, figured out on humility but anyway the, I, I will read somebody else's uh, definition which is uh uh simply the, and this is in the book uh Drop the rock. And I like this one the best. Simply a clear recognition of what and who we are. The middle ground between grandiosity and intense shame. Yeah. That's a clear recognition of the of the our assets, our defects, or whatever you want to call them. But who are we really? That's for for me, and not trying to hide it or not trying to exaggerate it. That's the and nobody ever gets to this like perfect place of humility, I don't think. <laughs> it's a it's daily it's a daily grind it's a daily you know it's a daily thing I, I think you know everybody i think tries to set off and trying to figure out who they are or trying to figure out what their purpose is and and for me it's like every day is purposeful if i show up and i do something courageous or if i do something that is helping someone else if i be of service um 
helping my fellow man, then I'm not asking for, I don't need validation. I'm just doing it because again, it's the right thing to do. It's doing the next right thing. Yeah. What I'm doing without even knowing it is I'm showing humility. I'm putting my, I'm putting other people first and myself second in, in service work. And I think for me, that's what it's all about. You know, the fact that I've got something to share and to help is what gives me all the humility in the world. Yeah. And but, I don't have to, I don't have to like proclaim how great I am. No, I don't have to. No. Here's the other thing though, that uh, I've worked with a lot of like little, little country club guys like you. And sometimes I'll just kind of challenge you on zoom right now. Okay. Sometimes I think you might even exaggerate this thing. So nobody thinks you're trying to be better than them. Oh, I've, seen, I've seen that in our pal Corbin. Uh, <laughs> that, that maybe not so much in me. I don't know. I can't see myself. I'm in myself, but I see it in you guys. It's like, are you kidding? You guys are beautiful. You don't have to <laughs> apologize for that because I want to repeat this the middle ground between grandiosity and shame. And you haven't made it to Braveheart yet, but I'm going to throw you in the middle and you're going to feel like you came home. Braveheart is a men's weekend that we do once a month at the last resort. It's a centerpiece of their trauma resolution uh, commitment. Uh, but almost all men come to the carpet and, and say some version of, I just, I don't feel like I'm good enough. Mm -hmm. you know, we all bring that no matter how, <laughs> I don't know what it's in the water. Uh, so we want to make sure that we're not try, trying to overcompensate for that or like letting it pull us under, right? Well, well, you know, one thing I want to say is, you know, when I'm talking about being of service and, and, you know, showing humility by being of service to my fellow man, I've always got to make sure that I, I still take care of myself. I think that was one thing that I, I when I first getting sober is I dove into the program. I did, I, you know, I was being of service. I was sponsoring guys, but a part of me was, was still suffering. And it was because I wasn't showing myself the same amount of humility that I was showing others. Yeah. You know, I still beat myself up quite a bit. I still fell short in my own life. You know, I still had certain character defects that I just wasn't ready to give away because it was, again, it was a, it was a protection thing. It kept me warm at night. And what I had to realize was that how can I be of service to my fellow man if I can't even do it for myself? And if I, you know, I can say all the right things in the world. I can talk, give good lip service, and I can, I can do all those things. But if I'm not doing those same things myself and being good to myself, am I really doing the right thing? Yeah, it's not a very good modeling. You know, it's, it's, you know? it's not. And, and now you're getting married. You probably have a kid. Now <laughs> you're going to have to do it. You don't want to be modeling that shit for. <laughs> right, right. You know, and, and, and to bring that up, you know, being and, and she, she's in the other room, so I'm going to talk about this quietly, but um, being in a relationship and being engaged and getting ready to get mar married, if that doesn't test your humility, I don't know what does. And I say that in the goodness of my heart because I have had to really walk through a lot of um, vulnerability yeah. to, because this is the woman I love. This is the woman I'm going to marry. This is the woman I want to spend the rest of my life with, have a family with. Yeah, it's, and, called, it's called intimacy. Right, correct. Did you ever, did you ever see that corny? Uh, ever see that corny therapist thing where you break down? It says in, to, me, see, into, me, not, see. Oh yeah. So yeah. you want to be in? You want to be in committed relationship? You are opening up the door for. Right. Uh, all right, here, here it is. <laughs> here I am. Right, and so again, it's peeling off those layers. It's like the covered up chair. It's like okay, I've had this part of my life covered up for so long. Mm. And now I'm sharing it with someone and I'm peeling, I'm taking things off one at a time, one at a time until I get to a point where she sees all of me and guess what? She's still here. She yeah. still loves me, if not even more for sharing that with her. Yeah. Committed relationship is sort of a, okay, I guess I'm going to have to do this six and seven stuff. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, if you want to, if you want to work a six and seven step, um, you know, get engaged because it's yeah. going to happen. Yeah. It's going to happen. And you, you guys have a bonus if you both have the concepts, you know, mm -hmm. and that's a, that's a mm -hmm. big deal. I'll just, I'll just say that. Because uh, it's, uh, the successful relationships are ones that are not singing 70s songs, right? Which is right. Uh, <laughs> that uh, you are my everything. You complete right. me. You finish me. You're my, ah, until they're right. wound around and choking each other. It, it, anybody that's not on the video, I have my arms all wrapped up <laughs> like snakes around each other. And uh, yeah. 
don't we want to bring a full uh, healthy self to the relationship right. And, right. Try, and, and not necessarily see the other person as the solution to all of this shit? <laughs> so mm -hmm. let me bring a solution. To, right, uh, bring a solution. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's amazing how the seventh step, um, it, it, it falls into a category that is under all areas of your life. You know, we can put it in with relationships talk about acting as if and, and, and covering up and then talking about fear and, and action and humility you can pull uh, you can take everything that i just said and, and build a relationship and that's what it is yeah so um, are you because still in my relationship i had to do all those things i didn't know how to be in a relationship so i had to act as if i was in a relationship yeah you still there i am can you hear me yep a little bit of glitching okay. here but it's okay i think uh we're i think we're good and and it, you know, uh, you you know the Bill W. Uh, writing about emotional sobriety, they they referred to that a couple of times in the around the sixth and seventh step. A little quote in there, looking beyond our addiction of choice to other areas of our lives, because that's the thing we're doing in this area is really opening our perspective. Do you call it d doing the next right thing? I might call it. Uh, just uh, choosing to look at all of my dependencies, not just right. the shooting up. Cause all, right. uh, and it's driven by, I feel fear and I don't want to feel fear. So I go do some shit to reduce the fear. It could be internet. It could be uh, relationship stuff. There's a long list of other ways that I use to get my dopamine and serotonin uh, cooking. Right. So look beyond our addiction of choice to other areas of our lives uh, allows us to see the addictive patterns in a lot of what we do and feel. Yeah. And it's just, the, you know, the book, the book Drop the Rock talks about it. It's um, you can't just treat the symptom. You know, you have to look at all areas of your life. This is a life changing thing. This you isn't mean, I just, can't make, I can't just control myself and fix that. I'll make it better. I'm, I'm, you mean, I've got to pray about everything. <laughs> got to, got to. And it's, uh. and it's, and, it, and here's the thing is, as complicated that, as that sounds, Bob, it's actually pretty simple. You know, it really is. The only person that makes it complicated is me and you. That's it. Oh, I've got to, it's got, I need 18 more books to learn how to do it. 18 <laughs> more books and then uh, I got to get two more degrees and then I'll be ready to right, let go of it all. Right, right, right. <laughs> and, um, and so if you're just treating the symptom, you're never going to be at peace. You know, um, when Bill W. wrote that, it was I think it was in The Grapevine, and it's um, it was a game changer. Yeah. It just was. You know, he was saying, you know, you can do all this and treat your alcoholism, but can you do all this and treat your life? Yeah. Essentially what that's saying. And he's asking if he's challenging you. He's, he's asking you a, a serious question. And if you can't, if you're only treating the symptom, then you're, you know, you're this, the old behavior that comes cropping up, you know, the manipulation, the lying, the stealing – the cutting corners, um, whatever the case may be, it's all, it's all gonna, still going to be there. You're just going to be using it in different avenues, whether you're gambling or whether you're overeating. You're going to start lying and manipulating about why you spent this kind of money or why you're doing this sort of thing. And, you know, um, it doesn't mean you have to be, you know, boring. You can still go out and do things, but you, you better be willing to face the consequences if you start acting out. When we when we've lived a life of uh, there, you know there's a there's a, a Jungian analyst in uh, in New Orleans. Oh, am I going to think of his name? Uh, I uh, the the War of the Gods and Addiction. And Nicole, if you're there, still look at look up the the author's name. But he he really makes a good pitch for the way that we act in addiction is like evil. I don't know much about all the evil stuff, but the shit that I did, it looks like, you know, the devil made me do it or whatever. So, um, you know, this, this uh, part of the process, and we do it so much that we're just in the rhythm of it, right? And it doesn't seem like it's natural. Yeah. yeah. It's a, and it's the, the one that comes most vividly to me. And I'm doing, I'm saying this for a reason. Uh, for so that this is useful to folks that really want to do this thing. I'm saying it to myself, but with maybe some people listening. It's like, for example, and it's funny, I've said it in meetings a lot because I, I think I've done it. I'm going to Walgreens, but I say I'm going to CVS. Right. Just right. because I'm used to making sure nobody really sees me. 
And maybe you have your own, whoever's listening, maybe you have your own version of how we just either lie or maybe we, uh, uh, you know, if somebody gives us the wrong change, we like take it and maybe not feel great about it, but keep doing it. And then we've done it so much now that it doesn't, right? I'm telling on myself a little bit here. Now, get the sixth and seventh step, encourage us to just try giving back right. the wrong change. Right. Try saying you're going to Walgreens. There's no hurt in it. But that's the action part of this uh, 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 area of the steps where there aren't any delineated actions in the book itself. There, but this is, this is <laughs> those are the real actions of transformation, I think, in the program. It's real work. And I think it's, it, and when Dr. Bob and, and Bill W, you know, devise these steps, um, there's a reason why they put the sixth and seventh step before making them, writing and making your amends. Yeah. Because if you're not willing to get humble, and if you're not willing to ask for help, and if you're not willing to surrender, how do you expect to be able to go up to people and make a genuine amends? If you can't show humility to your higher power, what makes you think you're going to do it in order to make amends to somebody that you harmed? Yeah, you yeah. Know, it, that's it, a good it, point. That's a good point. That's a great segue. We're, co- we're kind of coming close to the end here, but yeah, say just a little bit more about uh, – what what's the danger of not really doing a good sixth and seventh step and maybe taking the time to unpack it? Let me just see if I can, uh, I'm going to say the prayer. There's a prayer. Uh, my creator, I'm now ready and willing that you should have all of me, the good and the bad. I pray that you now remove from me every single defective character that stands in the way of my usefulness to you and to my fellows. Uh, give me the strength to go forth from here and to do your bidding. Mm-hmm. There's a lot in that. But it's, it speaks to it, right? And if, if we don't get still enough to do this work, and we don't want to take five years to do step six and seven, but to, I'd like you to speak to what's the main piece that people need to snag around six and seven in order to do this eighth and ninth step, which is about making a list of people we've uh, harmed and, and becoming willing to make amends and then making amends. You know, for me, and, and I'm going to read something out of Drop the Rock real quick, if you don't mind. Yeah. Uh, my favorite line in this, and it's in step seven, says, if, there's, if it's true that there are only two main emotions in life, love and fear, then all that we don't do out of love are we doing out of fear. Mm. And so for me, what six and seven is, is that if I can get to a place and I can, I can do a fourth and fifth and I can feel this, 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 warm sense of grace and then I have to go back in and I have to surrender all over again after I got all all, um, got through all the first five steps and if I can come out and actually go okay that wasn't so bad surrendering wasn't so bad and now if I can show myself the same love that I want to show other people that gives back that shows that's humility for me Mm -hmm. and I've got to be willing to ask for help when it's uncomfortable I've got to be able to ask God to remove certain things from of my life, even when I might not trust them, because it's what I've been told to do, and I know it's the right thing to do. I keep going back to doing the right thing, but it's just <laughs> doing told what it is, doing what we're told to do. What? Right, right, exactly. It's 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 <laughs> foreign. It's not you know. It's not what I'm I'm used to. But if I can act out of love and not act out of fear, then I I know that I'm being able to stay humble. Um, and so to do and uh, and and actually following through with with my word um yeah admitting when i fall short asking for forgiveness and then asking for help um i've got to be willing to do those things if i'm not willing to do those things then i can work the rest of the steps and i'm never going to do them honestly then you'll have a bunch of chaos in your life that's just that's an equation <laughs> it's a, and it's a know. daily thing yeah. it's a daily thing i mean there's i here's the thing i'm not perfect you're not perfect we're all not perfect people And so working a step seven, that's action that I have to take every day. Yeah, Jung, Carl Jung, Dr. Carl Jung, who's, uh, uh, well, anybody that's been listening to this is sick of me talking about Jung probably, but he said, uh, anything that is unresolved within us uh, will, will show up as fate. Any, any like shadow work that would, we, this is my, uh, this is my interpretation, any shadow or stuff that's unknown to us about ourselves that we don't dig into and, uh, and, uh, and acknowledge and become aware of, it will show up in our lives in some sort of way that we'll say, wow, that's bad that that's happening to me. 
right? That so mm -hmm. it's practical to do this work to stop the shit coming at me. It right. Will... <laughs> right. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's very practical, but we're so damn stubborn. We're like a magnet. Right. Yeah. Right. Do what I'm told, huh? Oh man. <laughs> All right, Trevor, this has been so cool, man. You are cool. You told me yesterday you were a little nervous about this. You're not nervous. You're like, <laughs> you're like, this is your, we'll get you back here, man. This is a lot of fun. So thank you for, uh, thank you for being here. Why don't you, uh, so how, how do people get a hold of you? And if they want to find out more about the last resort or any of the stuff that you're up to, how do they, how do they reach you? Uh, well, I mean, you know, you can reach me. Um, I, I give you out my work email. My work email is just Trevor C at last resort recovery dot com. Um, if you know anybody that's struggling, anybody that needs help, you know, send them a, send me an email. I'll make sure I get you in touch with the right admission person, and uh, and we can help out. The, the work that we're doing out at the last resort is I've I've been to a lot of treatment centers. I've worked at some treatment centers, and I honestly say this is an unbiased thing. I know it's going to sound biased, but it's unbiased. I wouldn't have quit my job and left everything I had in Oklahoma and moved down here yeah. if I didn't believe in the work we were doing. That's all um, right. We, they, they've, anybody that's been listening to this thing is already sick of hearing how great the last resort is. <laughs> But uh, it's true, man. I want people to stay alive and have this have this gift for life. And that's, you know, all treatment centers don't do that. It's like, here's a good Band-Aid. And the Band-Aid works for some people. Uh, but, you know, a lot, of, if you really got this addiction thing, it takes, a, <laughs> it takes it quite a bit to yeah. turn it around. It does. And if, uh, you know, also, we, you know, check out our website. It's lastresortrecovery.com. We're on Facebook and Instagram as well. Um, you know, we're here to help. That's what we do. Okay, brother. Thank you for being here. So thanks everybody for uh, listening. And uh, you are, uh, this is the recovery crew at the, at Deep Waters Recovery Programs and Network. We are a, we, get in touch with us if you want, if you want treatment of any kind, we, we know the places to send you. And I would love to have a conversation with anybody who wants to talk about this show or any of the shows. Uh, we are on all of the podcast platforms. We're on all of the social media platforms. Believe me, Nicole, the program manager, knows that because she's doing all the posting right now. Uh, actually, she's getting too good at it. She probably wishes <laughs> she's going to make a bunch of mistakes so I can ask her not to have to do it anymore. Uh, but uh, also, we are on YouTube. So if you want to see the pretty face of Trevor Cocheras, you can... Uh, you can go there for this uh, for this podcast. Uh, Nicole, you want to give the phone number and the other contact stuff? Yep, sure do. Um, thank you for li listening to the Recovery Crew podcast. Um, and like Bob said, we'd love to hear from you. Our number is 512-677-7847. Again, that's 512-677-7847. And our email is admin at deepwatersrecovery.com, A-D-M-I-N at deepwatersrecovery.com. And then you also asked for the author of that book, The War of the Gods and Addiction. Um, that is by David E. Schoen. That's, his right. name is S-C-H-O-E-N. So that's yes. the, the author you're asking for. That is some juicy stuff. If you're into Jungian stuff and recovery stuff, it's a, it's a really good explanation of how this gets up underneath the surface of who we are and runs the show. Uh, okay, so that's enough for today. I think uh, we will get... Uh, Trevor back on here at some point. Uh, uh, we the deepwatersrecovery.com is the website for all of this. Uh, we are up to helping people transcend dependency, uh, to uh, to heal the the trauma that uh, that lives under under the surface for most of us. We consider it relapse prevention, and then uh, launching into a life of meaning. That's the thing. Like this kid. I call, everybody's a kid to me, Trevor. Uh, everybody, like this guy is living a life of meaning. You can see it in his face. It's important for staying sober. We can't just get sober and then deal with the misery of our trauma. You got to launch into something that has meaning. That's what we're up to at uh, Deep Waters Recovery. And uh, so uh, thanks for being here with us. And you're in the deep waters now.